Here's the second lecture for our unit on acting, The Art of Good Acting, Part 2. The quote to start this one off is from a rather famous acting teacher named Stella Adler. She teaches the Adler method of acting, and she says, The play is not in the words, it's in you. So, what makes an actor good? I've given us two photos of actors who are pretty popularly considered good actors. We've got Tom Hanks on the left there. He's receiving his Lifetime Achievement Cecil B. DeMille Award from the Golden Globes. This was back in, I think, January of 2020, a thousand years ago. And on the right, we have Regina King, who received her Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for her role in If Beale Street Could Talk in 2019. Well, one key trait is believability. This is a shot from Ava DuVernay's film Selma with David Oyelowo starring as Martin Luther King and others. This is the March on Selma. And I chose that picture for this screen because here we have actors playing historical figures, reliving a historical event that is very much part of the public consciousness and you know, the key to success in this film was us actually believing that these people were the characters they were portraying. So believability, this means the, char the, the character seems to be having an authentic experience spontaneously before our eyes, that this has never happened before, this is actually happening. This is where it becomes easy for us to engage that willing suspension of disbelief. And there's this kind of liveliness, this spontaneity. We seem to see the character thinking and responding and reacting in the moment. Believability could also mean that, you know, the character's physical presentation matches our expectations for that character. Another hallmark of what makes an actor good is unpredictability. Here we have Lucille Ball from the classic 1950s television show, I Love Lucy, and her character is Lucy Arnaz. So unpredictability, right? We are going to be surprised by their choices. We're going to take some pleasure in wondering what they're going to do next or how they might re respond to the next thing that's thrown at them. And this is an important trick, right? Because they are reciting memorized text that has been pre-written down and they are delivering it as if they're spontaneous thoughts. Another hallmark of a good actor is vulnerability. This is a shot from the 2014 movie Birdman, or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance. This is the actor Michael Keaton playing the role of Riggin. Um, in this scene, if you haven't seen the movie, Michael Keaton is playing an actor who is rehearsing a play. He went outside in the alley to smoke a cigarette wearing his bathrobe. And the bathrobe got caught in the door, so he had to run down the alley, into Times Square, down the street, into the front doors of the theater to get back in to his rehearsal to make his next entrance, and he's in his skivvies. There's not enough money in the world for me to agree to do that. And I'm sure a lot of people would be, oh, hell no, themselves. Sometimes acting isn't glamorous. And that's important, right? This is really what kind of separates good actors from stars, right? That to be vulnerable as an actor means you are going to be willing to share something painful or imperfect or raw emotions of the character. The actor is going to be able to fully commit to the physical action or the emotional depth of the moment. And that really does take some courage because the actor has to be willing to look ugly or silly, you know, or undignified in the moment. Here's another one. Listening ability. Here we have um, Kaylee Coco as Penny and Kunal Nayar as Raj in The Big Bang Theory from 2008 or so. Um, she's confiding in him and he, his character has a kind of psychological tick where he gets so nervous around pretty women he cannot talk in their presence. And so that makes him a good listener. And what this means is... is kind of many things, right? A good actor is going to give the other actors their full attention when they're not speaking their lines. 
uh, young actors or not so good actors have this tendency to kind of come alive like Siri, speak their line, and then go into sleep mode and kind of shut down until they get their next cue. But that's not really how humans behave. Uh, okay, sometimes we tune each other out. But if we're having a meaningful conversation with someone where we have a high stake in what the outcome is, we usually are paying attention and responding to what the other person is saying or doing because we don't know what they're going to say or do next. So even when the attention and focus of the scene is elsewhere, the actor has to appear fully alive on stage at any given moment. And this is critical, not just for when everything is humming along the way it should be, but it's key for when something goes wrong in a play, a piece of scenery or a special effect doesn't work, or an actor forgets the line, or someone misses their entrance. You have to know where you are in the script and where the story needs to go next so that you can get things back on track. I don't know if you've ever seen a live performance go off the rails, and but I've been to some where you know, it's been pretty painful and people have floundered around, and I've been to others where the actors on stage have improvised you know, bits and it's been hilarious and the audience kind of roots along with them and then they get back on track and things go on. But you've got to be able to be listening and paying attention to what's going on to recover that. Okay, I'm making up words here, but another hallmark of a good actor is physical transform ability. Here we have, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, 24 different characters, all played by the same actor, Gary Oldman. Um, and as you can see, he's getting a lot of help from hair and makeup and costume or in the bottom right there and top right animation artist, right? But as you can see, he looks exceedingly different in each of these roles and um it's not just the makeup or the costume or the wig that he's put on but it's also how he's speaking how he holds his body what accent he's using how he fills up the space in a room what energy he exudes right each character is different it's never just gary oldman time after time after time there are some actors out there that when they perform, we're like, yep, that's them. And we see the actor all the time and we kind of don't see the role. A really good actor is one that kind of suppresses their own sense of self and becomes whoever the character is that they're portraying so that you forget, oh yeah, that's Gary Oldman. And so related to this is physical ability an actor's real life physicality, right? So their own sense of self disappears. As I was just saying, they become the character. And sometimes that means they've got to take on certain special skills like riding a horse or swinging a sword or playing basketball or, you know, handling a gun or, you know, you name it, right? Um, the actor playing piano, right? The actor has to be really good at looking like they know what they're doing. And so lots of times there's a lot of physical training that goes into their work to prepare for a role. So it's all about voice, posture, gesture, gait, all that sort of stuff. Oh, what about likability? Does an actor have to be a good person? You know, someone you want to have a beer with in order to be a good actor. I've chosen here this picture. This was in 2013. This was Jennifer Lawrence, right when she received the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for Silver Linings Playbook. And when she was walking up to the stage to accept her award, she tripped on the hem of her dress and fell down and kind of had a little moment there on the stairs. And America's kind of collective heart just went like, aw, because she was so damn likable. I am of the opinion that Jennifer Lawrence is a very good actress. Certainly her public persona seems quite likable. I mean, we're not friends in real life, so I don't know, but um, seems likable enough. But we've always got to separate the actor's personal life and personality from the roles that they're playing, right? And lots of times actors have to play characters that aren't likable. They have to play bad guys. And so being able to let go of what everyone's going to think about them is a really important key to success in acting. So it all comes down to authenticity. Audiences want to believe that the actors have an experience that they're pretending to have on stage. And performing is discovering and taking on the truth of a character situation and then communicating that truth to an audience, which is, you know, some sort of magic spell. 
So if you want to be an actor, things you got to get good at is script analysis, uh, powers of observation, because good actors are always looking at other people around them. How do they walk? How do they hold their coffee cup? How do they speak? What's that gesture that they're keeping their hair out of their face with? You know, all those kinds of things. And they store them away or they write them down in notebooks or they just have a really good memory and they can draw on these little details that they've borrowed from other people and apply them to a character. Right. So mimicry, the, abil the ability to imitate what other people do and having good attention to detail. Also, I think having a thick skin is very helpful because someone's always going to have an opinion. So over the history of acting, um, you know, it, we know at least 2,500 some odd years ago in ancient Greece, but certainly other places around the world in India and Japan and in South America and in other parts of Europe and in Africa, um, that there have been different kinds of acting performed for millennia. And there are lots of different ways to do this. So here are some main ones. Sometimes an actor will wear a mask, right? When you put a mask on, your own face disappears. This false face gets put on and that false face is frozen in a very specific expression. Greeks certainly use this. Lots of different Groups in Africa use this, India uses it, right? Um, and it, it's a very powerful tool of communication, right? It also requires the actor have a really strong voice to be able to be heard past that mask. This kind of acting looks very strange to our American 21st century eyes, but it was quite common in a variety of places for quite a long period. Another way to act, right, might be to use mime or pantomime, right? Mimes act things out without words. It's all physical gesture. And pantomime and mime, it's you're, you're pretending to walk a dog or drink a cup of coffee or be stuck in a box, but you're interacting with invisible objects. So when you're doing that, your hands and your body have to be very precise. You have to know how big the cup is or where the doorknob is or all that sort of stuff. And you have to really, down to the smallest detail, get those actions correct because you don't have the physical thing with you, but you need to communicate that to the audience so that they can almost see that invisible thing. All right, for a few centuries uh, in Europe and certainly uh, in ancient Greece as well, we had this thing called rhetorical delivery. And it was almost like a secret code of gestures and postures and vocal inflection and facial expression that were supposed to enhance the meaning of words when you were delivering a speech. You know, so chopping your hand through one air or holding one finger high over your head or pounding the table, or I don't even know what they all are. You can see this guy's doing lots of odd things and they're explaining what they're supposed to be, right? But it, it was kind of like this secret code that when you do this one gesture, it means this. And everybody in the audience understood that at the time. Um, I think if any of you have ever been to like a business communication seminar, they'll teach you 21st century versions of some of these techniques now. And as I'm sure you've noticed by now, the way I kind of gesticulate wildly about in the classroom, I'm not very good at it. Another style is to use sort of symbolic movement or gesture, right? It's kind of tied to that rhetorical delivery stuff, but it's really more about the acting out of a scene. Like you can see this still picture. I don't even know what this is from. Um, my guess would be Snow White, right? Because that woman is holding out the apple and this other woman is looking at it. And this is not really how real people behave or hold their bodies in real life. If I were to hand you an apple, I can't imagine any of you would kind of bend over and put your hands on either side of your face and kind of pout and look alarmed, right? And I would not be holding my hand extended, looking away from me with one finger on my lips. This is a very exaggerated kind of, I'm spelling it out for you, what is going on here? Um, way of telling a story. But this was a wildly popular style of acting. And it still happens this way in things like cartoons or in children's theater or in um, like what the British people um, do at Christmas time called pantomimes. Um, it's still wildly popular in some forms. 
But for about the last century, we've really been dealing with what we think of as realism, where we want our actors to look and sound and behave and act the way regular people do this. We want actors' behaviors to mirror objective reality. And this was first really brought about by this guy named Konstantin Stanislavski, who was an actor and a director at the Moscow Arts Theater in Moscow, Russia. And he was working with a group of people, you know, at the late 1800s, early 1900s. And the people that he worked with at the Moscow Arts Theater, these were consummate actors of their day. They were very, very physically fit. They could sword fight, they could dance, they could ride horses, they could juggle, they were highly trained vocally, they could speak several languages, they had perfect diction, they could sing, they could orate, they knew all of these rhetorical gestures um, and pantomime and this kind of, you know, um, symbolic gesture that I was just talking about in the last slide. So they had this huge, incredible, like, physical bag of tricks that they could draw on to portray their characters. And Constance and Stanislavski started thinking like, ah, this doesn't feel like enough. So he introduced this idea that instead of kind of using this bag of tricks and imposing all of these, you know, surface details on, on things, he said, let's go deep inside our psyches and really try to bring out that emotional inner life of the character through action and subtext, right? Action that is tied to what the character is thinking instead of this random gesture of, you know, pointing my finger or sweeping an arm this way. I want to have a gesture that would be the same as if I was doing it in my real life. So he wanted playable, meaningful, high stakes objectives. And he took his actors and started to really train them in how to do this and started doing their plays in a whole different way. Audiences went wild for it. Lots of people asked how he did this. And so he started writing it down. And he was like, well, this is just my method of doing it. And it just became known as the method or method acting. And this really took off in Russia and then to other parts of Europe because they went on tour um, and then over to America. And for much of the 20th century has really been how actors have approached their craft. I think it's no coincidence that this style of acting developed right around the same time Sigmund Freud and others were developing an understanding of, um, you know, psychoanalysis and psychology and really trying to understand what makes the human brain work. So I'm not an acting teacher. I can't really teach you how to do this, but I will share with you a couple of things that Stanislavski taught his actors. He said, okay, let's use some techniques like the magic if, which is, you know, let's say your character is Antigone and, you know, she has to uh, go bury her brother who has died, right? And you'd be like, yeah, okay, but I have never had to do that. I've never had a brother die. Heck, I don't even have a brother. I have no idea what that experience is like. Okay, well, the magic if. Sit there for a little bit and concentrate and try to imagine how you might feel or think or behave in that character situation. If you really can't do that, then try something called emotional recall, which is when you think about a personal experience that had the same kind of emotional context as what the character you're trying to portray is feeling. So maybe you never had to bury a brother, but maybe you had a beloved dog who died when you were nine and you had to have a funeral for the dog, right? I'm not saying that brothers and dogs are the same, right? But if you haven't been through an experience like Antigone and who among us have, right? This is maybe the closest you can come to that. And you can remember how sad you felt during that. And then you can use that emotional response to inform how to play Antigone. And Stanislavski says, well, how about sense memory too? Where he says, you know, the more ways you can kind of trick your brain into recalling these emotions is by engaging as many of the senses as possible, which makes total sense if we're thinking about you know, that article from a couple weeks ago, The Lively Brain, um, where the brain is lighting up in the areas of physical activity and sensation, even if we're just reading, right? So sense memory, 
So try to tie as many sensory experiences as you can. So the sights, the sounds, the smells, right? The tactile sensation of an experience. And when you try to focus on like, God, what did it smell like then? And what was, you know, what did it feel against my skin? And what sounds was I hearing? And try to really recreate that moment in your head. It brings you that much closer and much deeper into the emotional state you were in. And then you can more easily slip into that and communicate that out into a believable and emotional performance. It's a lot, right? There's a lot going on in there. Now, Konstantin Stanislavski and the method is certainly not the only way to do, quote, good acting in the 20th and 21st century. There are lots of other methods and lots of other teachers and practitioners. Stella Adler, whose quote was at the beginning of this slideshow, is one of them. There's viewpoints. There's all kinds of stuff. And, of course, other forms of theater that are not Eurocentric, for example, Japanese no theater or... Uh, Sanskrit theater out of India and lots of different other places have entirely different approaches and methods and styles. But we here in America in 2020 are are well steeped in this method acting because this has been the kind of go to process for like the last hundred years. Right. But so notice how much actors that are trying to use the method techniques, they're really relying on generating empathy within themselves in order to create an empathetic response in their audience. It all comes back to empathy. It's at the bottom of it. You've got to feel the feels so you can make the audience feel the feels. And that at the heart of it is good acting. 